I'm uncomfortable driving it. I'd no. like to go back. I'd like to go back. No, we'll go back in a little while. Drive a little bit more. This would be worried about their transmission. Amco, double A, MC. Hey, it's a stop sign over here, okay? What are you doing? Hey, fuck you, Larry. Where's the radio? Larry, where's the radio? Hey, what are you nuts? You idiot! Fucking asshole! Get the license plate. Hi, this is Jeff Garlin. This is Susie Essman. And uh, we're cops here in Los Angeles. We have three open murders, correct? Oh, could you imagine? Unsolved, yeah. I'm sure there's more um, than three open murders in Los Angeles. We are back. What you don't know is we've had a bit of a break because I've had COVID and Susie was out of town. And now we're getting a groove again. And we're pretty uh, happy about that. Yeah. Still in the middle of production on yes, season 12. So having a ball, by the way. There has been one day where I've had less than an amazing time since we've been... There's been one day or there hasn't been? It hasn't been, been one no. day. You know what I discovered about myself? Tell me, Jeffrey. I am only really, really happy when I'm doing Curb. Yeah, I'll stop even there. I could say stand-up, but stand-up, you know, sometimes... you know, Stand-up is so fraught. <laughs> it, it, it can be. But that being said, I, I truly am happy when we're doing the show. I, I am, too. I, yeah. I think Larry is. We all are. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. We're so, all I, happy to do it. And happy, having, we have yeah. a great time. And we're, yeah. you know, and all the the other ancillary people that people that watch the show don't see that we're so happy to be with. Yeah, everyone's there pretty happy. Yeah. So today is... Amco. Double A. Uh, uh, episode MCO. 7. Which, episode by the seven. way... This was actually episode three. Well, you know, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because as I was watching it, I was thinking you had mentioned that the time before that Amco was out of order. Yes. The last uh, episode we did six, The Wire. Yeah. And you had said you felt like that was when Curb came into his own, which I think really got hit the groove in our next episode. Yes. Beloved Amp, which we'll we'll talk about next uh, episode. But this one seemed like it was shot before The Wire. It seemed like it was before it got the groove going for how the show was actually going to be. It most definitely did for me. Yeah, me too. Uh, You know, watching these episodes, especially the early seasons, I get really sad. Why? Well, for the most part, because of the way I feel and look. You know, it looks like I look like the Michelin Man. I've I've recovered from a stroke, which I keep mentioning. Well, then Um, you had just recovered from a stroke. Yeah, and so... I watch it and I feel bad for myself. I empathize with myself. I feel sad. All right. And um, interesting. Yeah. You know. By the way, what an upstart <laughs> or whatever you say. Well, so we start the the episode. Yeah. And you just bought a gorgeous '57 Chevy. Yes. And that car was beautiful. Yes. Just absolutely beautiful. And you love old cars. N- no. Yeah, you have one. Yes, I have a 1966 Pontiac GTO black on black convertible. The reason I have that, it's a car that I love. I love muscle cars, and that's the first official muscle so car. So you didn't of all love time. this 57 Chevy? Not at all. I okay. had no interest in it, but, but I like the color. Well, it was beautiful <laughs> to look at, you know. Yeah, no, by the way, I'm not saying I disliked it and was upset driving it. Right. You know, but it wasn't my jam. It wasn't your, okay. So we start off the episode and you're getting a 57 Chevy. Yeah. And then uh, you're walking down the street with Larry and he's approached by the homeless guy who doesn't like tuna. Which, by the way, <laughs> I actually was in New York And I was sitting in front of Lincoln Center having my usual, oh, I'll eat this tonight and I'll start fresh tomorrow diet. And I was having... How often has that happened to you? In my life, hundreds of times I've done that. Hundreds upon hundreds. I mean, maybe even into the thousands, if I'm being honest here. Um, Anyhow, I'm sitting on a bench there, very relaxing, it was like 11 o'clock at night. It was after yeah. a gig. The lights are on. The yes. Chagalls are behind yes. you. And I had a box of, uh, I believe that night, and it's weird that I remember these things, it was frosted strawberry. Pretty sure. Okay. And I also got a milk. And by the way, I, how weird. I would get a box of Pop-Tarts and then a gallon of and when, when low are we fat talking milk about? or skim milk with it. Well, it's, you know, it's got to be the 80s. I lived okay. in New York then, okay. you know. 
And I ate the whole box of Pop-Tarts, no surprise there, at least if you know me, and I drank the milk with it. When I was done, I had like a half gallon of the gallon of milk. And there's a homeless dude there, and I thought, oh, I'll give it to him. He I'm not going to waste some calcium. Yeah. And I went to give it to him. He goes, no, nah, I don't drink skim. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, what? I've had that experience, yeah, too, of trying yeah. to be helpful and, and having it. Uh, yeah, so that I immediately thought of that, you know, I don't eat tuna. One time I was walking down the street with my husband, Jimmy, and there's a woman there crossing the street in upper Manhattan. And she's all hunched over and she's got a, a walker thing, but she was like completely, her face was almost at the ground and she was in bad shape and I walked over to her and I said, can I help you across the street? And she looked up at me, mind your own fucking business and started uh, screaming at me and Jimmy felt like that was such an appropriate thing. That was to classic experience. New York, which exactly. where everyone's truthful. By the way, that's the opening of The Odd Couple. That's He's right. He's hitting him with the, the purse. Trying to help her across the street and she's hitting him with the purse. I love that opening. Okay. So the homeless guy doesn't like tuna. And, you know, you know that's going to come back somewhere. Yeah. And of course it does, but we'll get to that. And Larry then goes home and Cheryl's friend Julie is there returning a, a tape or a DVD. A, a of, VHS, a of, VHS sour grapes. of Sour Grapes, which Larry's was movie. the movie that Larry wrote. Did he direct it? He most certainly did. He wrote did. and directed yeah. after he left Seinfeld. Yes, Free curb, and it was you know it it was not the most well received movie in the world. By the way, no, it wasn't, and that's why Curb was so great. Prior to Curb, he got punched in the face for sour grapes, and he got punched in the face for, for the, the finale, finale of Seinfeld. So this was sort of like uh, you know uh, an uplifting thing for him to do the show. And it was a very funny scene where he says to her, "What did you think of it?" And you just see her. Well, dancing. the best thing that she said. Was it was the perfect length. It was the perfect length. <laughs> Which, uh, there was fun stuff. Fun stuff. You know what's amazing about her saying that for something that she clearly didn't like? I'm always confused when people see my stand-up friends, acquaintances, and they don't even mention it. I know. And so I think, I think I did great. The audience gave me a lot of energy. Was I bad? Because I, I, I like to. You know what? I why, think this, why, this happens to me, and I have a particular yeah. friend who comes to see me in things, not just stand up, this and that, and then never says a word. Uh -huh. And then I hear later how much she liked it. I think people don't understand how much we want to hear. Not that we want to no. hear it. I I'm going to say the word. I'm going to say the word need. need. To hear I was just it. about it's to not a discuss. want. It's a need. It's a need. I think just people don't understand. Just one positive affirmation. Nothing exactly. more. You were great. I remember a group of people coming backstage, and. Didn't say anything to me, but my opening act were effusive with my opening act. Uh huh. Who did That's pretty disturbing. good? Yeah, <laughs> and I really destroyed that night. You know, uh, and look, I know. Uh, believe me, no one you knows know when better you're than good me and bad. when I I'm know. good and bad. So that's always all very, did. very confusing. But perfect length. I mean, that was all great stuff. That yeah. she. You know, this episode is filled with friends of Cheryl's. And a couple of people from my world, which uh -huh. we'll get into. Oh, but literal friends of Cheryl's. Because it, 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 was, it was TV friends of Cheryl's as well. What do you mean TV? I mean, you're saying... Oh, yeah, yeah, on TV. Yeah, yeah. So Larry comes up with stuff sometimes that I'm like... He just... I love that he's open to whimsy. What I mean by that is when he starts going fun stuff, like uh, like Johnny Carson, yeah. and he keeps doing it over and over. Yeah. It's like you have to be so open to just start doing stuff yeah. like that. Which you could could not really do on a scripted show. Oh, that's God, the no. God, yeah, no. That's Even the when I was on the Goldbergs, I literally was at a point where I had to uh, ask permission if I wanted to improvise and let them know exactly ahead of time what I might be saying. You know, if I uh, want different to, shows are different like that. I mean, when I did Broad City, they were totally open to improv. Okay, that's and Broad it was City. Very... I'm talking about the Goldbergs, who last time I checked, Patty Chayefsky was not the writer yeah, of it. Yeah, but I'm just saying it's just different shows. Some shows are very free and loose, and some are word perfect and, and sticklers about that kind of a thing. I think that... They were like that on the Goldbergs? Uh, yes, I, I I find that most shows that aren't something I dig, that I've worked on, yeah. uh, very tight with the writing. Drama, like more so than comedy, you would no, think. No, I'm talking about comedy. Really? Yeah. Well, drama, it's assumed 
because you can't improvise and make a drama better. You know, I think in terms of law and order or whatever, it's like there's a there's a bink to the bink to the bink. Yeah. Now, comedy, you got to be open to. When I about. used to have a recurring on uh, SVU, uh-huh. and I played a defense attorney, and right. they were very strict, and uh-huh. it was all courtroom jargon, and it was impossible to learn. Because it was, it, st- it didn't make any sense I to me. I never had more problems with my dialogue. Was I was SVU the one I was on? I think so. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyhow, because your your dialogue has nothing to do with what the person just said to you. You have to just remember your dialogue with right. no cues. That's right. And no logic. And it was impossible. It's for very me. difficult. It hurt Especially my brain. Especially for us. Yeah. Because yes. that's not you know. Yes. Some actors you know have no problem with it at all and enjoy it. Richard Kind, he loves to learn lines. Richard Kind, I'm going to tell you something about Richard Kind right now. Uh, for those of you who don't know him by name, and I'll just use our show, he plays uh, cousin, cousin Andy Cousin Andy on our show. Richard Kind is a unique human being. And Richard you Kind... You could say that again. Yeah, you know, when you're shooting a scene, the camera's on you, and the other person, it might be a dirty shot, means a piece of their shoulder is in it, right. or they're completely off, off. camera. When Richard is off camera and he's doing his lines with you, and mind you, the coverage is on you. You're the one on camera. He's not on camera. If he screws up his lines, he wants to start over, <laughs> which is complete and utter it's, it's insanity. Not, it's not necessary. And it's not normal. All right. So there you go. So fun stuff. And then uh, the, the friend leaves and Larry's, you know, clearly knows that she did not like Yes, he talked to Cheryl about but yeah. I, I, I just want to say one thing that I found very interesting there that just occurred to me for the first time. To me, Larry, except for the little darkness in his hair, he's not completely gray, looks almost identical to the way he does now. Not that he would look suddenly different. You don't agree? I, I, he's older, he's yes! Older. He's I know, 20 years older. I know, but he still looks <laughs> he so... Looks, yeah. well, I he's, mean, he's, all right, whatever. He's vital. And Larry looked like an old man when he was a young man. Well, yes, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Now, this is what struck me about this next part. You know, Cheryl gets very upset. They're having a dinner party Friday night, and the caterer canceled. So she feels as though she has to cancel the dinner party. Does it never occur to these Hollywood people she could cook? It was eight people. I know. She could have cooked. She could have gotten takeout. But come on. That's, that's not an exaggeration. That is the way it is. I, it would never occur to me to cancel oh, a dinner Siders? party. Yeah. Well, you and it would never word, occur caterer. to me to have an eight-person dinner party catered. Well, by the way, that's the west side of Los Angeles. I guess so. No, that is. I've been to numerous west side dinner parties, and I don't remember one without a caterer. Let's explain to our audience who are not from here what yeah. that means, west side. West side is like Santa Monica, Pacific Palisades, Malibu. West of the 405, west basically, of the 405. Is but it's it's towards the ocean right and uh, the people who live over there are genuinely very wealthy right and Larry lives over there because he's genuinely wealthy no very wealthy Um, but not everybody who lives there is genuinely wealthy well no people live in apartments but they are overpriced apartments so I'm just saying everybody there makes a decent living but most people who have houses there they make a great but it's a beautiful place to live because it's it's near the water yeah it's That's near where the you bo- stay. Yes, yeah, where I stay. Um, because we shoot most things yeah, on the west side. Yeah, but those people, they always... You know what I think? As I've gotten older, I've always thought of myself as a, sort of a regular Joe, even though I have an extraordinary life. My private life is very ordinary. And I've worked hard since I had a family. Let's keep it ordinary. It's not anything. So these dinners. See, I'm a New Yorker. As you know, I have never moved here. We're in L.A. right now. Yes. Um, And I've always lived in New York. I have never been to a dinner party in my neighborhood, in the city, wherever. That's that amount of people that's catered. It's no, not a because fucking the wedding. People, with few exceptions, people in New York are very real. And people here on the West Side are full of shit. So there I said it. If you're a West Sider, come after me. Let I don't me, like any of you. Let me ask you this. When you were married to Marla and you would have a dinner party, was it ever catered? 
I don't mean a, a big thing like you used to have your oh, the, 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 the Yom Kippur. Break the fast. Yeah, break the, I don't mean that. Uh, we had a lot to of. To my knowledge, no, I don't recall ever. Marla was a great cook, and as far as I can remember, she always always cooked. cooked. Yeah. So anyway, it just struck me that Cheryl, not Cheryl. Well, Cheryl, Marla character. is a great cook. I hate saying was. Okay, Marla is. continues to cook delightfully. I'll be at her house on Sunday night, next Sunday night for uh, Hanukkah, and I know she's going to make the latkes and all that stuff. And for you non-Jews listening, I'm not going to apologize for being a Jew. Why should Just you? stop it. No, because I'm doing a lot of Jewish no. references. Um, all right. So uh, who doesn't love a latke, by the way? I, I, I might not cook the latkes. Are you a sour cream latke person or an applesauce? A sauce? sour cream. I'm an applesauce. Okay. We, we all live our lives. Friends. Yeah. Um, now, latkes, for example, I might not cook. I might go to Zabar's and get them. Oh, by the way, getting something from Zabar's does not mean you're catering. No. Okay? All right. So, okay. So, Hanukkah, Hanukkah. You know what that reminds me of. What? Uh, it's We'll get to oh, it Kevin many, many Meany? seasons later. No. Uh, okay. The scene where you're dropping me off at the airport. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm singing to myself. Oh, yeah. That <laughs> but was that's, a good that's one. season nine or ten and or we something. We've got a ways to go. We've yeah. got a ways to go. Okay. So, Larry says that Jeff has a neighbor who's a caterer, and she's fantastic. So, Cheryl is delusional, and she thinks that her friend really liked the movie, they go back to that. And Larry is like, no, she didn't. Yeah. Well, she clearly didn't. And then Larry says to her, What is this compulsion to have people over your house and serve them food and, and talk to them? It's fun. What a it's strange a little thing. gathering, a little huh? party. By the way, it's something that a lot of listeners and myself wonder the same thing. I, You know what I love? I enjoy serving people food and talking By the way, to them if I'm and over, entertaining. If I'm over at your place and there's not a lot of other people, I'd be happy. Yeah. But when there's other people, I'm not too thrilled. But what if it's just a small, this was a small dinner party. I mean, I'm good with I'm good with a dinner party. Yeah. I'm not good with a party. A party party. Me neither. I yeah. hate a party party. But, By the but, way, but this where week, you can converse... I like that. There was a point where, where I remember where I always had to go to everything to, for either my career or to meet a guy. All right, let me ask you a quick question. And we are really deviating from the show We can this deviate week. as much as we but want. But any of those times that you went to the red carpet and you did the thing that your publicist or whoever manager told you you had to do, did it change your career in no, the slightest? No, not one iota. I know. That's the joke Not one iota. It. But yeah, I remember when I used to feel the compulsion to go out. Right. You know, and part of it was to meet a guy, too. Oh, yeah. You never knew. You know, it was yeah. always... It, Louis Veranda, who is our friend who used to run Catch Rising Star in Caroline's, used to say to me, Essie, you got to wear your sign. What meaning your sign saying, I'm available. Oh, well, but I think when you walk in the room, at 10, I think the best sign you could wear is, I'm not available. Well, whatever. It's okay. no, it's irrelevant. Okay. It's a moot point at this right. point because I'm an old married woman. Yes. Okay. So I'm sorry I said yes. You're um, a married woman. So Larry is talking all about he can't have a good time. And Cheryl does not understand why can't you lighten up and have a good time at the dinner right. party. Right. And he's absolutely sure he's not going to have a good time at the dinner party. It's all Cheryl's friends. Yes. And he's absolutely correct. And they make a bet, which is that if he doesn't have a good time, he gets a blowjob in the car. Why do men love a blowjob in the car? I was just about to say, is there anything more upsetting or unsafe than a blowjob in a car? Totally and unsafe. And by the way, we have an episode with blowjob in the yes, car. Yes, you and I, but and, we, were, and, we were parked. I know, but nonetheless, <laughs> even parked. Oh, actually, I, I no, a couch. we weren't parked. We got into an accident. Yeah, I know, but nonetheless, I, I'm always a big fan of a couch. Uh, a bed. I mean, there's many more places. What is it with the car? I don't get well, that. Well, either. I think it's I think it's the illicit, and I think it's the, uh, you know how there was that episode, and and everybody, everything always wanted to know about sex. Remember where uh, they were like doing it in everywhere, in elevators and in department stores, uh, and and there's something about. That, that it's eroticized. Now, now, a good bet would be, uh, Larry said, uh, uh, if I'm not bored, uh, you have to blow me in Times Square. That I would find interesting. That's a good dare. Yeah, but that's never going to happen. I know, the car I'm, might. Yeah. I, I'm just telling you, I have had many boyfriends in my life who have wanted blowjobs in the car. Wow. So I'm asking you as a man, what is the, I'm the appeal? I'm pro blowjob. Well, I don't have it. I don't see the appeal. Okay, fine. All right. Then we'll move on for that. Okay. And then they're in your office, and you're talking about Swanson turkey dinners. Which, by the way, 
Remember those? I remember those. I used to have, also have ones with like a clown on it. I remember when I was a kid. I loved TV dinners when I was a kid. Yeah, me too. Love them. Was your mother a good cook? Yeah, she was, but she loved cooking chicken. Yeah, a lot, of, a chicken. lot of chicken. My mother was not a good cook. So on the nights when my father wasn't home, that's when we would have TV dinners or uh, get pizza. And that was heaven. Or chicken yeah. pot pie, which I loved. The you know Swanson, I used to not do? the bird's eye. You know what I used to do? I used to love just saying, pot pie. <laughs> I, I would actually just stop in the middle of my stand-up <laughs> and look at the ass and go, pot pie. And they go, why is he saying pot pie over delish. and over? No, I just like the way it sounds. A couple of remembrances I have of that scene. A, how fucking funny it was that I get serious, have to sit on the couch with him. Which, was that a character? <clears throat> Completely out of character. Things were not gelled yet of no, who no, we all I, were. I would never do that. We would both laugh about yeah. that. So... Yeah, that and also, I remember more than any other scene I ever did on Curb, and that was episode three, like I said, that I had brain fog and I had trouble enunciating, you know? It was really difficult. Why do you think that um, is? Well, because I had a stroke. Oh, so, it, yeah. You know, it, yeah, so. How long uh, ago had you had the stroke when you started shooting? Six weeks. So you had the stroke after the pilot. After the hour before the first episode. Uh-huh. So I also look at that scene, amongst many scenes that season, but that scene in particular, as the way I got my mojo back, got mm-hmm. my voice back, mm-hmm. got my mind back. Like I was forced to. It was better than any sort of uh, speech therapy. therapy or, or, yeah. yeah, physical therapy. Well, let me, let me just, we didn't say what it was. You say to, to Larry... I'm hurt. There's something I want to talk to you about. You get up, you walk over to the couch and sit next to him and you say, You never congratulated me on my new car. And I have written down here, so out of character. Yeah, no, it's really... Because it was. And it's interesting how doing this this first season, it's interesting to see how, how things gelled and developed right. over the course of the because season. Because that scenario would be something Larry and I would laugh at yeah. about someone else. Right. I would never give him you that. You believe he was hurt that I didn't go to his car? You know, yeah, that kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. So then you're in the car. You say, the car is fun. Come on, drive it. The car is fun. And put the radio on. Well, wait, wait, hold on. So I'm watching with Sari, who was a film editor. Yeah. And she goes, oh, that green screen is terrible. As the scene goes on. And I say, What's honey, green that's, screen? I said, that's Studio City. That's real. Yeah. She goes, it looks like bad green screen. Oh, really? Well, that's how bad. Now, they, they, wait a know. minute. Tell people what green screen is. Green screen is there's a green screen behind you that they can superimpose the street where you're driving. Anything. Uh, they can put you in a forest. They can put anything behind right. you on a green which, screen. Which is used all the time M- in very making much. TV But they and film. have come so far with the driving green screen stuff that it looks pretty gosh darn I mean, good. frequently when you do a driving scene, you're just sitting, you know, in a thing and the green screen's behind you and you're not moving right, even right. the car. And they they bounce it up and yeah. down and whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's it's the the magic. Yeah. So the, you say put on the radio and uh, the Amco commercial comes on. Are those commercials still on? I don't think so. I wouldn't are be surprised. Are they still on anybody in the room? Well, uh, they are. And by the way, when I hear that beep, beep, and I've heard it on the commercials, I thought someone was honking at me. Yeah. yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah. So so uh, Larry thinks it's a real honk, and he starts a fight with the guy behind hey, him. Hey, it's a stop sign over here, okay? What are you doing? Hey, honk at these fucking And the guy gets oh, pissed yeah, off, rear ends Larry, the, the car, yeah. and see. Yeah. But nobody got the license plate. And then we drive and we can and see it's And there's a noise damaged. and you can see it's severely damaged. Would that really happen? It seemed like he tapped it gently. Well, by the way, in all reality, a car like that, uh, the other car would be damaged. You know, in 1957. That car was a tank. That's, they all were. Those, those bumpers. I remember my father-in-law. Uh, he used to say, don't get a Japanese car because it's not the same metal. The American he cars in the street. Yeah, we completely believe that. Okay, so now we're at the dinner party, and yep. clearly it's fucking brutal. It's so boring. All of those people, except for one, all are Cheryl's friends. Like in real life? Yeah, they're all groundlings people. Okay. Yeah. But, oh, they, well, they were good 
improvisers. Yes. But in in the TV show, they're all Cheryl's friends. They're yeah, all yeah, Cheryl's no, no, boring. No. Yeah. Cheryl's friends are playing Cheryl's friends. Yes. And they're all really fucking boring right. in the show, not in real life. There's eight people, and one is uh, Allison and Kevin, and they're, they're moving to Covino. Maybe it's Downey, and then the yeah. other's going on a cruise and put a fucking gun to my head right. if I was sitting there listening to this. Right. Production of Annie Get Your Gun. By the way, that's what it was like for me at like school events with the other parents. I understand. I wanted to die. I understand. Yeah. Um, and, and Larry clearly wants to die. And it, I, I love the way it was done. I mean, it was so clearly, I mean, they're lovely people you could see, yeah. but they just, you know, dull, yeah. dull, and by dull. the way, there was some great stuff cut from that scene. Yeah. I remember one of the guys, he was a groundling guy, very funny. I think his first name was Kevin, or still is, I'm sure. He had this one scene where he's telling Larry about all the things that he's writing, whatever. And he says, uh, do you have it? Like, do you want to submit it? And the guy goes, no, it's in shards in my trunk, the guy tells him. <laughs> that he, but he used the word shards, that it was cut up in his trunk. Anyhow, it's I didn't pleasure. give it a sense. It's a pleasure to improvise with good improvisers. Oh, it's the best. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this, in this episode. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Mike Duffy. Now... Mike Duffy introduces himself, asking Larry uh, if he gets uh, if he gets paid every time a Seinfeld airs, which I thought was hilarious. Turns out he's an Amco dealer, and they dinner is served, and he pushes ahead and takes Larry's seat at the head yes. of the table. And the way he does it is so natural. And and just and even the speech. Let's talk makes, about who he is. Well, that's what I want to talk okay. about. Okay. One of my biggest influences, when I say biggest, I'm talking about two or three biggest influences in my career, is Mike Haggerty. Mike Haggerty played Mike Duffy. I learned from him by watching him at Second City, by working with him at Second City, work with, working with him outside of Second City, being friends with him. He knew how to use the economy. Uh, he Like, he would come into a scene at Second City, and everyone's blah, 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 blah. He'd come in, say less than a half dozen words, get a gigantic laugh, help the leave. scene move forward, yeah. and leave. Yeah. And he did that repeatedly. Uh, he's the king for me as improvisers. Uh, uh, less is more. Mm -hmm. You know, doing less is all you need to do. And he was a master and he showed it when you say was is he no longer with us Mike died about uh, six months ago oh really okay yeah which is heartbreaking to me and others and who you knew, knew him. him from Chicago yeah Second City he was a gentleman I remember one time the Bulls are in the playoffs Michael Jordan's playing we're sitting in the upper rafters of the Chicago Stadium and me with my ADD and there wasn't like a cell phone situation then, but I brought the newspaper with me. And while I'm watching the game, I'm reading the newspaper. And I remember him screaming at me, put the paper down, watch Jordan. What the fuck are you doing? I remember that he was so furious. But yeah, I used to do like 10 things at once when mm -hmm. I was younger. Uh, but Mike, oh boy, I mean, one of the masters of that craft. And by the way, I can honestly say a big influence on putting Curb Your Enthusiasm together. And and if in, you, in, in what way? In terms of what I knew about improv. Oh, from you, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if anyone out there enjoys my acting and, and and notices there are scenes where I don't say anything or I only say a few things, one place and one place only that comes from is Mike Haggerty. That's the influence he had on me. And well, he's hilarious. Yeah. In this and when episode. he sits down to the head of the table. Just uh, have a seat wherever you'd like. How about that? Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, this is great. Huh? Look at this table. Huh? Oh, God. China. <laughs> These chairs. Huh? Solid. You like that? Oh, yeah. We got to get some with the wings on them. Oh, you know? sure. We go to Ethan Allen or something. Sure, back Come on, sit down, Larry. Everybody, uh, just uh, dig right in. huh? I mean, there's uh, no reason to wait or anything like that. I mean, you know, we'll just take the courses as, as they come along. Dig right? in. You heard him, man. Dig yeah. in. Have yourself a good time, all right? I, I, I think Larry will agree with me on this. Uh, oh, for sure. We don't stand on, on tradition in this. No, you know? no. However, there is... One tradition that uh, I particularly enjoy, and um, please join me. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Bless us, the Lord, of these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord, Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come on. 
Let's break bread, huh? May I start with my salad now? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. It's okay. It's, he said it's okay to start the salad, everybody. Right, everyone. It's such a natural move. The comedy is not forced. And when he goes into the prayer... And first he said, everybody dig in. Yeah. He, he completely takes and over. Larry's and then, having fun. He's like, yeah, you hear that? Everybody dig in. But he's not being mean about it. He's sort of enjoying the nonsense of it. And then he says, Grace. Yeah, which also is so natural the way he does it. That was the thing that struck me as I'm watching. I'm like, boy, that dude is as natural and smooth an improviser who uh, that I've ever seen. I, but one other Mike, he's Mike Haggerty aimed to please like his friends. He was telling me he was doing this this movie with Michael Keaton, where Michael Keaton's a police officer, and he was playing a police officer, and uh, he's playing like a video game in a bar. With, you know, and I said to him, "Is it going to be gunplay?" Oh yeah, Jeff. There'll be there'll be a lot of gunplay. And then he knew I wanted to hear him say gunplay. That that tickled me all night long. Anytime he could throw gunplay into something he was saying, I just was so fucking grateful. To our listeners, are like, what's so funny about gunplay? No, I get hooked on things in my mind. I've got so many mental issues. Popeye. Yeah, Popeye. Um, so yeah. um, he says grace, and then he and Larry start making boring dinner conversation, which I quite enjoyed watching. Yeah. Friends was a good show. You know, it's all yeah. about what, what, what comedians call civilians. Right. No, it know? is true. Yeah. Well, by the way, let's even not call them civilians. We're carny folk. Yes. That's the best way to look at it. Yes. We're the people who are running the Ferris wheel missing a finger. We're carny folk. It's not people's problems. It's our problem. And they're doing the best they they're can doing to the communicate. Best they can. It's us that are screwed up. And Larry then, then they leave and uh, Larry, you know, makes the, the shiddock with him about the Amco. I'm going to call you and I'll, I'll grade everything. You'll fix the car because he fucked up your car. And he says to Cheryl, you know, that he really enjoyed the Young Republicans Club. Next time I want some Jews there. Uh-huh. And Cheryl lost the bet. Yeah. So the next morning... Uh, after he decides he doesn't like the Colgate, there's a phone message from Mike Duffy that he feels a little weird about something from right. the night before. And that, that uh, by the way, I noticed Cheryl looks so adorable. Oh, she's, she was so she's cute. She's really, yeah, like, she was so young and she, cute. But young and, and, and but really uh, just gorgeous. Yes, and so like, Vibrant. Yeah, vibrant. That was yeah. a good word. And Cheryl thinks that the thing he felt weird about was that she mentioned that Larry doesn't like anybody to stay at their Martha's Vineyard right. guest house. And he I said, mean, if it's between him fixing Jeff's car or him staying in our guest house, Jeff's out of luck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and he goes to get an Apple turnover and from last night, and there's no leftovers. The caterer left no leftovers. What the fuck is that? So Larry is going to go to her house to go pick it up. And by the up. way... I have never seen that or heard of that. And I just thought, you know, with, as most things in the show, that has to have happened to Larry. Probably. I've never yeah. heard of that either. Yeah. But the but caterer I'm, always, but, you but pay for the food. it's a great premise. It's a great premise. Yeah. You leave the leftovers. Yeah. So he goes to the caterer's house and the caterer says, I'm not sure that everything survived the trip here. Which yeah. I found and by the way, that was Deb Thaker, also a Second City person, uh-huh. Toronto Second City, an excellent improviser. And she's plays her role up, up with a plum. Beautifully. Yeah. yeah. Where's the chicken? Uh, she says, I gave it to a homeless shelter. And you know, it's all bullshit. Mm-hmm. You know, and then we find out the truth that she dropped the food off at Jeff's house. Right. So Larry goes to Jeff's house. Jeff's eating the chicken. I mentioned this in, in episodes past. I don't know which one. When I get caught, I have a thing I do and I wasn't conscious of it till I watched the episodes. So you walk in, you catch me, go, hey, hey. Always. Yeah. Always. You never noticed that? Well, no, not until I watch. Oh, By the way, when I'm improvising on the show, I'm never going to a toolbox. What I'm do you mean pre- by that? In other words, I don't have my catchphrases. I don't oh, have no. my stuff. I li- I, None you of know, us do, really. Larry actually ruined something for me once, and I've become conscious of it, and I resent it. And that is the shoulder shrug that I do on the show like when something's wrong and like yeah, a, yeah, you don't and know you, what to say yeah, and, and he pointed that out to me and I never noticed it so now not as much when I do he it he didn't point it out to you in a negative way no but I don't want to be aware of it alright well get it out of your head <laughs> so uh, so Larry says you take 10% of my salary now you take 10% of my food blah blah and that, then you move on to uh, 
discussing Mike Duffy. You go to see Mike Duffy. Larry's in the office with Mike, and he apologizes. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on one second. Did here. I skip something? Yes. What? I wrote down my rash cleared up. Yes, I wrote that down too. Rash cleared up, but I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is either. <laughs> I don't have a fucking clue. Uh, let, but let's do a little mystery thing here now. It's got to be a line that Larry said. He went to the Amco. No, he went to the caterer. I'm just because uh, this is around when it is. It's before. No, because I have I have it after the Jim, after Jim, Jim, he came to your home. house. I don't know. I don't know. I so have this, I have crazy it here is too. that? My rash cleared up. We don't even know what the fuck it and is. And I have it All here right. too. All right. Um, then then Larry's in the office with Mike and. Mike says, yeah, I feel a little weird about something. And Larry jumps in with the Martha's Vineyard right. thing where what Mike was feeling weird about was that he took the head of the table and took Larry's chair. But then becomes a whole argument about the Martha's Vineyard. I, I don't need your house and I don't need you and I don't know. By blah. the way, I'm just going to point out a nuance of how Mike Haggerty made it smooth. So Larry sang his Martha Vineyard thing. And Mike goes, no, 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 I was just talking about sitting at the head of the table, the table. And Larry starts going into his thing. And Mike very quietly goes, but Martha's Vineyard. Yeah, I know. And then so when it came to him, he set himself up. It made up. sense, yeah. Yeah, it was beautiful. I mean, I'm just such a big fan of And I of love it. how he ended it. I think we're done here. Yeah. So you and Larry are driving the Chevy. It still sounds bad. And then Larry has the catering trays, and he meets the homeless guy again. Right. And gives him the chicken Laurent. Right, all of it. Et cetera. And the guy takes it. And then and that's it. Then Cheryl and Larry are driving home from the restaurant and somebody lost the bet. And we know what's happening next and we don't have to see it. Wait a minute. Does it end on that? Yes. It does. It ends on them in the car. She undoes her seatbelt. And mm. uh, blowjob is to follow that we don't see. Right. By the way. Thank God. Uh, I don't want to see it. Him getting a blowjob from Cheryl? No. I don't even want to picture it. <laughs> I have no desire to anyone I know to see them have sex. And that was double AMCO. Uh-uh. All right, well, did I tell you that I love you and I adore you? Uh, not today. All right, well, I'm telling you right now, I love you and adore you. We'll see you next time, everybody. Right, and thank you for, if you listened the whole way through, I think that's amazing. Thank and you. And here's to Mike Haggerty. Yes, to Mike Haggerty. All right, thank you. Thank you.